Schoolnet Academy and uh, nice to see some uh, familiar faces here or some familiar names in the chat um, and do introduce yourself um, if you have the chance uh, in the chat in the meantime. A couple of housekeeping points. Um, <clears throat> Uh, first of all, this meeting is being recorded, so um, and the recording might be used for dissemination purposes, so please be aware of that. Uh, second of all, as you have probably noticed, um, you do not have the opportunity to unmute yourself. Um, we will, however, give you the permission to do that when it comes to the Q&A session. In the meantime, please make use of the chat. Please ask any questions or make comments about the presentations um, in the chat, and we will pick those up when, it, when we come to the Q&A part of this uh, webinar. So um, it's a great pleasure to um, to open this uh, thematic seminar, which will be organized in the form of two webinars, one today and one tomorrow, on the topic of effective use of data in teacher training. Um, as mentioned, we will be having two webinars for this seminar. Uh, the first webinar is the one today, uh, focusing on the topic of learning analytics in teaching in teacher training, with a keynote presentation from Professor Hendrik Draxler, who I will introduce in a moment, and followed by a Q and A session. Uh, and the second webinar is happening tomorrow at the same time at two in the afternoon. Uh, and at this webinar, we will be uh, having three. Uh, practitioner guests with us who will be talking about their use of data in their teacher training context. And I'll uh, give a few more details um, about who the practitioners are um, at the end of uh, the webinar. So hopefully you will also be able to join us uh, tomorrow at uh, two in the afternoon. Now, just in case you're not familiar with the European Schoolnet Academy or European Schoolnet in general, um, some very brief words uh, of introduction. The European Schoolnet is a network of ministries of education. Uh, and as this network, we are running the European Schoolnet Academy, which is uh, a training platform for teachers where we primarily offer MOOCs for teachers. It was launched back in 2014, and since then we have uh, run uh, 91 MOOCs with around 170,000 uh, registered participants. But as part of this um, uh, academy, we are also running uh, thematic seminars which address that topics that are of interest to our network of ministries of education, many of which um, are engaged in training activities and teacher training activities directly themselves. So in the past, for example, we have looked at the topic of blended learning in teacher training or peer assessment in teacher training. And European School in general uh, has been looking at the use of data in schools um, over the past year in particular and continues to do so this year. So in this context, we also want to look at uh, the effective use of data in a teacher training context. Um, this is, of course, relevant for our own work in the European School and Academy, but it is, of course, also a key topic of interest in um, uh, yeah, numerous countries, uh, numerous ministries around Europe who are working on the topic of teacher training. And I think it's clear to everyone that uh, the use of data is, um, or the availability of data, um, is rising exponentially, especially with the increased use of digital tools. If you think about the kind of uh, data that is collected by learning management systems. And as part of that, it is uh, absolutely essential that teachers um, know and have the competence uh, how to make effective use of the data that is available to them to improve what they do in the classroom. So if we think about that in the context of teacher training, well, we as teacher trainers need to be able to support teachers to make effective use of data to support their work in the classroom. And that also means that we ourselves need to make effective use of data to improve our own teacher training offer. Um, simply because, well, it can benefit the learning experiences of the teachers that we work with, but also because it models good practices that um, allows teachers to, to replicate those uh, when it comes to their work in the classroom. So it's these two questions that uh, we aim to explore today and tomorrow. And um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to uh, welcome uh, Professor Dr. Hendrik Draxler. Uh, as the keynote speaker for the session today. 
Uh, professor Draxler is a professor of educational technologies and learning analytics with affiliations with the German Leibniz Institute for Ed International Educational Research, uh, the Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main and the Open University of Netherlands. And his research interests include learning analytics, personalization technologies, recommender systems, educational data uh, and many others. And as part of his work, he is also a board member of the European Association of Technology Enhanced Learning and for five years was also a board member of the Society of Learning Analytics Research. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today, Professor Draxler, to talk about this topic on learning analytics in teacher training. And before I pass the floor over to you, let me just mention that uh, Professor Draxler also prepared a report for European Schoolnet, uh, which we published uh, back in December. Uh, and uh, in that report, um, he goes into uh, a lot more detail than he will have the chance to go into today in the presentation. So really highly recommended reading for after the webinar. And I'll share a link to the report at the end of the webinar, of course. So um, without further ado, then I would like to pass the floor over to you, Professor Draxler. Uh, yeah, looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. Um, hi, everyone. Great to having me. Um, just let me share my slides. You also see my slides, right? Yes, we can see them. Excellent. OK, great. Um, I have half an hour to talk you basically through the report that we have been creating um, in December for uh, learning analytics and teacher training. And the interesting part was actually when uh, Benjamin came with the um, task to make a report and a presentation on teacher training uh, for learning analytics that there is not so much in the area of learning analytics um, for specific teacher training. You can find a lot about learning analytics in schools, learning analytics for, for the students basically, but not so much for teacher training. And uh, we identified this actually as a gap um, in the current body of knowledge on also practices on educational technologies and made this first report where we um, tried to draft the current situation of learning analytics and how it fits to teacher training. So the talk will be based on, on an introduction into learning analytics. So maybe that's a new topic to some of you. The field is there since 10 years, 12 years now. Um, but still, I, I will try to summarize for you learning analytics in a nutshell. Then show a connection to educational science and uh, how educational science is connected to this. Um, examples of learning analytics in schools, potential training scenarios for teacher trainers that we thought about how teacher trainers could be involved in um, learning analytics exercises. And then we drafted some ideas about and why um, maybe a learning analytics supported professional training program at the European uh, Schoolnet Academy might be a wise thing. Um, that's up to discussion with you guys then. Okay. Well, Benjamin already introduced myself to you. Um, just here, some logos of the associations that I'm involved in. And maybe one thing to mention is that in all three university setups that I'm, like the Leibniz Institute, the Goethe University, as well, the Open University, we are really focusing on teacher training, uh, initial teacher education. So I have a close connection to this from the Faculty of Computer Science. OK, when you define learning analytics, um, uh, then you basically um, come along this, this statement that you can easily Google learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, reporting of data about learners and their context for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. It's a nice summary of uh, what learning analytics means and it's from the first conference of learning analytics that has been in Banff, Canada 12 years or 13 years ago. And when we talk learning analytics, very important is that you need to consider on which level you actually want to do learning analytics. So you have educational data coming maybe from a Moodle environment. Some of you are Moodle experts that's on the chat. Then um, you could consider that uh, applying learning analytics for one course, this would be, and one student would be the micro level. So, and then you really need to take this level into account because you support an individual learner in an individual course. So it's a certain setup, but you could also do maybe analytics on, on a whole faculty that has many courses in that Moodle environment, then you would be on the meso level. And for sure, you can even scale it up to a macro level and then it's an institutional approach um, 
um, that that is faced then and there are different indicators and different analytic approaches that could be followed up on the micro level you're more interested in really giving feedback to learning and achieving goals on the meso level you look more for learning paths and how um, students or trainees move through um, a course setup or a curriculum on the macro level you have then um, higher order uh, kpi so to say that you want to monitor so it's important in the very first step what kind of analytics i'm actually planning to do uh, another thing that is important is to make a distinguishing between um, data subjects and data clients um, so most commonly um, you have the learners in this pyramid in this hierarchical model um, in an institution where the learners are the data subjects because they act in your environments they probably leave traces with data behind and then you can consume them and the trainers or the teachers would then be um, the data clients that work on that data and do something with the data for feedback or other purposes. But also when you consider such a hierarchical model, then also the trainers and the teachers could become subject of um, uh, analytics processes and then they would be the data subjects and the institution is collecting um, data about um, the trainers and the teachers for sure. This all needs to happen in the, in the boundaries of the European privacy law and data protection laws. So especially that institutions consume information more trainers and teachers is a very delicate thing um, and, and needs to go um, with a high commitment. Um, and that also belongs to harvesting the data from the learners. But just keep in mind micro, meso, macro and who's the data subject, who's the data client. I brought you here one very easy example, just to give you an example. Actually, it was my first example on learning analytics when I started this research um, 30 years ago. Um, what you see here is basically the curriculum of one of our courses back then. Um, and what you see here is the curriculum and its activities. When we planned, and this is days, study days, right? Um, so 70 study days, and that's the activities that should be done in that course in that um, uh, in this in this course at that time. And then we plan certain activities at the startup and then some other activities should happen. And um, what you see at the red line is then basically what one of the students did compared to what, what, what we expected them to do soon. And what you already saw, there are some um, things that we did not expect, for instance. So we just put uh, on top the, the time when students deliver their activity and you see that there's a difference that um, they delivered uh, for activity 17 somehow 10 days later something but did in the meantime other things so that's something we did not uh, consider in the curriculum and also at the end of the course where our resources allocated and so on they had showed totally different behavior they finished the course earlier and they don't go through all activities there and that's nice if you do this for one student, but it becomes really powerful if you do it for a cohort of students, right? So then you would have a cohort of students from the whole faculty going through this course. And then you would see, okay, just by putting the timestamps when somebody delivers something and what we expected, we see the same pattern again. All of the students deliver here later and all of them have a different behavior at the end. And I mean, this is a very easy example of learning as is just using advantage of process data and there is no uh, mining or any mining technology involved, but it shows us how powerful this technology can be for optimizing learning for understanding your curricula and to provide personal feedback. Because in the traditional mode, I would have sent out um, a questionnaire at the end how well this course was achieved, but I would never get the feedback that there is a structural problem in the instructional design of that course without the analytics. And that's for me was an eye opener that this is a field to explore and invest further in 13 years ago. And yeah, for sure, this um, is today on an even different magnitude. So when we when we scientists talk analytics, we put it into frameworks. You need to have a model of things that you understand. And also in 2012, I came up with the following framework for learning analytics that still holds. So that framework still holds for us for all the analytics projects we do. Um, and I will talk you through this um, framework. It basically is a starting point. If uh, a new partner comes to us, we discuss with them these six dimensions. 
um, and pro prepare with them an learn learning analytics project. It's roughly on the blue, it's the six dimensions, stakeholders, objectives of learning analytics, data of learning that are used, instruments that are applied, external constraints like conventions, norms, ethics, privacy belong here, but also internal limitations like competences, target group, acceptance, etc., of the analytics process. And this all together um, forms then a dynamic to roll out a learning analytics project or to start a learning analytics project. And let me talk you through this um, with some triggering questions that um, you need to answer for yourself if you want to start analytics projects or do analytics in one of your courses. So for instance, on the stakeholder level, what we do there, um, we follow uh, certain methods, we do uh, use case studies, we do personas like Elias, he's a student from the Goethe University, and he describes um, certain uh, preferences he would have to learning analytics and things he wished from this to so make personas of different people and use them then. And questions that trigger us when we run such a project are, what are the specific needs of your educational stakeholders, teacher, trainers, teachers, and how can learning analytics solutions help satisfying these needs? Because it should really satisfy a need. It should not be a technology or technical exercise because it's so great to do analytics. And how can different stakeholder groups be supported by learning analytics tool in a meaningful way is also an important point that I will also stress a bit later when you see um, there can be very easy analytics like counting downloads of PowerPoint slides or something else, but this is really not very meaningful if it's about learning. And in the meantime, the field developed that further that we really aim to competence development, developing and supporting a competence and providing highly informative feedback to learners. And that goes beyond just counting um, certain activities. Objectives of learning analytics are always reflecting. So reflecting about the past period, reflecting to um, what I wanted to do and how others do it, and prediction, um, like you see here. So the reflection part often goes together with certain graphs. You see then a graph of, of yourself, like the orange line here um, being yourself, and the, the blue one, the average of other groups. So you you can put this in contrast and compare yourself, or the blue could also be your previous self in another course and how you do now. So that would be another reference frame. So it does not always need to be a comparison against the group. And that's something I stress very strongly um, because education should also not always be a social comparison. It should also be about individual development, right? And then you have predictions. A very famous system was the core signal system from the US, where um, they used certain trace data and process data and made predictions if um, a student is behaving well or not so well, and if an intervention is needed. In that case, in the US, um, if green, then nothing happened. Orange was a bit of alarming. And by red, then the um, study advisor basically called up. Um, the, the learners and, and ask them for if they can do anything to support them. And here also triggering questions for your own projects might be what are effective visualizations to support awareness or reflection processes? Can someone cope with this graph that I showed here? What are promising predict predictors to forecast learning progresses? I mean, predicting is a very delicate thing too because it really uses the data we have right now. There's a lot of discussion on biases in this. So what is actually a predictor that is, that is that's a good protector for the forecast? And how to recommend or cluster learners into groups to recommend then personalized path, a personal learning paths to them or provide personalized feedback to them? Um, I will have one example about a group activity where we just did this, where we then, um, due to educational um, technologies and um, artificial intelligence, had emerging groups of different types of learners, and these different type of learners receive different types of feedback. So it's the personalized feedback is really bound to a to a group. It's not really um, on a on a personalized on an individual level. Then we have data. Um, last 13 years of research, for sure, we have a lot of data. And also here, we um, released in 2022 um, the open layer, the learning analytics indicator repository. You can find it on that links that we provide there, down there. And uh, why we do this, we, we 
like other disciplines, we want to build up a body of knowledge that what has been applied, what can be applied, and uh, what results came out of this. So we have that in psychology, for instance, in psychology of certain instruments, they are well studied, they have the certain um, certain studies connected to it, and then they apply these instruments again and improve them. And the same thing we want to do very often, learning analytics projects reinvent the wheel. So they start a project, they look what kind of data they have, and then they use this data. And we want to put this process on, on around and basically ask rather what kind of learning you want to support, what other indicators and metrics that people use for this learning assignment, and can you use them as well? And that's something we put into um, this article. Just give you another representation of the open layer tool. So if you would have a, a event, a learning event like receiving information, and it could be a reading activity, a presentation or a watching video activity. And then on a literature study, we identified for reading activities, the following indicators that are used in learning analytics, reading analytics, discourse analytics. And we also show you what kind of metrics is from the Moodle system or whatever learning system have been behind this and have been aggregated in which way to provide such an indicator. So it's a it's a repository of learning analytics indicators in the past. And describes nicely what data is used. And also here, um, triggering questions are what kind of digital learning tools are used in your organization? So make an inventory of those. Uh, for which of these tools do you have access to the data? That's um, also a topic, not always you have access to all tools. And how meaningful is actually the data on for micro, meso, and the macro levels? So how meaningful is this data? If you want to provide uh, feedback to reading analytics, then it does not make sense um, to, to basically use data from, from downloads or activities and logins into the Moodle environment. Technology, for sure, there's a well, there's a lot to say about technologies. But on the other end, you should also it, it's like this: we uh, that technology is there. The problem in analytics is no longer the technology. You just need to have a strong partner. You can um, do these things with. Um, we analyzed when in 2020 which strategies actually are used for different learning analytics infrastructures. So um, you can find their um, report on different infrastructures and most common tools. Um, but this is also something that can be addressed. And also you can have wonderful visualizations from uh, learning analytics data, like this Sunbeam visualization we applied once um, to show certain metrics and indicators for a course, mainly for the teacher. And also here, you have to ask you certain questions. What learning analytics information are most suited and meaningful to the stakeholder groups? And ask personalized information provided to the learners increase actually effectiveness and efficiency of the learning process or what kind of aims you follow with the analytics process. Um, then external constraints. Um, here it's mainly about ethics, privacy, um, everything that comes from, from, from the outside to our organizations. Um, here we thought already before GDPR, the European Data Protection Regulation was out, actually we came up with an article on privacy and analytics. It's a delicate issue and came up with this delicate checklist you can see here to the left. The delicate checklist was invented to basically break down the complicated discussion on uh, ethics and privacy, if you're not used to it, to, to, a, fact, to a fact sheet, to a checklist. Like, um, for instance, medical doctors do in the hospital. They also have checklists for certain procedures. It helps you to go through it. And inspired by this, we came up with Delicate and uh, envision that this is something you can have in the office. And if you want to have a quick judgment on privacy and ethics, you can take the, the Delicate checklist and fill it in yourself to, to make a judgment with what kind of uh, sensitive data you're working with. Um, based on this previous work, there's a couple of other um, practice, code of practices, code of conducts actually on learning analytics. The learning analytics community takes this topic very seriously because it can be a real showstopper for learning analytics. If you don't do the ethics and the privacy right at the very beginning, then you might invest a lot of money and then lose later on the whole project. So that's a very important topic. And therefore, for instance, also this is an example from SURF in the Netherlands, the SURF organization 
they came up with a whole um, with a similar guideline on learning analytics for um, under the um, GDPR or the German the Dutch version of the GDPR. The same we did in the, in the Germany and also in the UK. There are different examples of this code of practices. And also here, triggering questions are what are the potential biases in the data we are using and how can we manage these bias biases towards fair usage? I mean, this is a super hot topic because the data we use often um, replicates current problems we see in the society, like disadvantages for colored people, disadvantages for female people and so on, especially if you go to STEM education. And we need to do something like this. You cannot just use a data set like this and then do analytics on this because it might be an unfair treatment. So this is an important thing to, con uh, to consider. Um, and how can you train your stakeholders to be actually more knowledgeable and responsive about their own data? That's also something that um, we, we address with a, with a series of workshops. And what kind of security measures we can take to guarantee trusted and unbiased learning analytics processes? So this is what is covered in these um, policy documents, um, and that is very helpful. And you should start really from the very beginning, actually, of analytics projects. Then um, we get to internal limitations. Internal limitations, it's all about the person. So information and data literacy, you might have heard about. So the skills that the people have there, but also feedback literacy um, comes really into the focus these days. Um, so that's all about how can we measure the effect of learning analytics on the stakeholders? Um, how can we, can you train information and feedback and data literacy skills to your stakeholders um, so that they can really act on the analytics results, that they can criticize the learning analytics results, that they can speak up on them? That's very important in such an algorithmic world. And how can the use of learning analytics and teacher training be a way for teachers to apply learning analytics in their own classes might be something for teacher training for sure. And just about the feedback literacy, that's something we invested in now very recently. Until now, actually, we did a lot of analytics, use data, and we gave them back and dashboards or feedback text. But this is just one side of the coin. What we miss is the other side of the coin to understand what actually the data subjects are doing with this feedback. And therefore, we invented the feedback literacy instrument to measure their skills in this and also to see how the uptake actually of this uh, feedback generated by data is done. Yeah, that was learning analytics in a nutshell. Um, now I talk you through the other points that will be shorter for sure um, than the introduction to learning analytics. Um, we talked about to not use easy um, uh, indicators, for instance. And I just brought you one paper we have been publishing in 2017. Actually, the work on this was done in 2015. And when you look at this, so uh, this was a forum discussion, um, in a forum discussion where different study groups of students um, have been interacting together. And uh, we use then the forum posts to basically give them feedback on uh, initiative. So how often they take the initiative in this um, process, how responsiveness they are. And this was um, how often they reply basically to, to another post and how present they are in the environment by logging into the environment and by also taking into account um, initiative and responsiveness. But also productivity was then a measure. Um, that was combined in the learning analytics uh, measure that was combined from initiative and responsiveness. And I put these indicators here to the right, and you see there's not much magic in this. So basically, to measure initiative, we um, counted the number of top level posts. So the first post that was made, that was an indicator for initiative. Then, number of commented posts answering that top level was responsiveness, basically. And then um, presence was number of page views. Um, this was in that environment was page view, everything. Whenever you get and be active, you had a page view. That was your presence indicator. And then productivity was then basically the initiative indicator plus responsiveness divided by presence. And this was the way how we did analytics. And we have two papers on this uh, work from Marlon Scherfel, and we could show that this widget already for this group did really help to 
degrees a lot of conflicts we had, but students that are surfing on the shoulders of others don't doing so much. Um, the teachers really liked it. They wanted to use this for sure for, for assessment then, but this is a repurposing task. This was really meant to give feedback to a study group. And um, yeah, it was very positively um, perceived and was a nice study. And I, But this is early analytics. This is using just log data and do no further artificial intelligence or something on it. And I just want to show you the same exercise on forum activities with a group that we apply now. This looks like this now. So we have a correlation matrix. We have a bunch of indicators under there. And um, you also see that the level, uh, the amount of indicators we use um, increased. And it's no longer just a counting task. It's really um, more an artificial uh, intelligence task with using an, um, advanced artificial intelligence. So all, we still have participation, user posts count in relation to the group. Newness is basically a, a semantic measure where we measure if you post something new to the group or you just start to um, still repeating what others say or just agree, so the newness level. Then density, amount of information related to the lengths. So because we measured lengths at one point, but also then the density of this, how much you actually contribute then with this length of text to it. Then we got responsi re responsivity. This is the semantic relatedness to peer posts. So how much you really rely on arguments of the others and incorporate them into your reply. Social impact. Um, this is um, how often people use arguments from your posts and uh, use it in their peer posts and then internal cohesion semantic relatedness of your posts uh, of your own posts and then uncertainty we also can measure the uncertainty level of posts and you can see easily from this um, indicators that they are so much richer than the indicators we had in 2015 that um, we can give really highly informative feedback about how you write how well you do it and how you could improve this and um, this ongoing work. And on top of this, we also have different types of um, students, different cohorts that receive this. So and if you consider a teacher training program um, that applies learning analytics, you should really go to these latest models of learning analytics and not, um, not redo basically the things we have been doing uh, five, six, seven years ago. Okay. Example of learning analytics in schools. Um, so what are the what are actually teachers in the schools are facing? So um, as we said already in teacher training, we haven't seen so much um, learning analytics applications. At least there's not so much published about it. But for, for sure, if you're a teacher in a school, you 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 face a lot of digital systems in the meantime. So um, and we we just choose one open and one uh, commercial platform to just give two examples in the report. Math Tutor is an intelligent tutoring system that you can create class lists and so on, and um, it's divided into problem sets um, of math. So it can give very well um, describe if a student has understood certain concepts of mathematics. And the teacher can select then different problem sets and make assignments for the students and also receive then on dashboards certain information um, about the feedback, uh, about the performance of, um, of the students in that class. So, and that's a typical analytic system for mass that, um, that is used these days. And just uh, going back to the Netherlands again, their Snapit is um, a big provider of commercial uh, commercial learning system. We could have taken many other um, commercial systems here um, for the, we, we just used one open, one commercial system. And also here you see it's similar to Mass Tutor. It's also for mass training. It uses learning analytics algorithms to adapt exercises to the current skill level of, of certain pupil in school. And then the algorithm models, then the probability that student answers uh, a question correctly and calculating its student ability score, they call it. And for here, also you get then dashboards like this, where you as a teacher can go over the, um, the exercises. You see your class, you see what is going wrong and well, and then you could select one of the students where multiple things going not so well and, and put them into a class to really um, do more 
um, exercises with them and to basically bring them on the same level the class is already. Potential training scenarios for teachers trainings. So we together with Benjamin, we thought now what, what could we do basically to um, get training scenarios for teacher trainers to, to work on this. And there are currently two promising um, exercises from my point of view. Um, one thing is the uh, fellowship of the learning under the Dick's learning activity. This, this is very nice because it's very low tech. You can basically, um, it's a board game, you bring into the into a, a room and you you use these cards, you have different cards for what kind of pedagogy you're doing. And what you actually do here is you work on indicators. So you put down your whole course, you enter the class, um, you do a peer work, how do they do the peer work, what technology are using, and then we build up on this process step by step, what kind of indicators and what kind of tools could be there, and also what your question as a teacher or as a teacher trainer for this course is. And this is a very powerful method for people that have no clue about um, learning analytics, but also the technology behind, um, behind certain educational technology tools to build up such a um course and become aware of the indicators that are used there and since corona we also have a digital version of this where you can basically once you understood the board game you can use the digital version to um, lay out your cards you can store the information there you can bring courses back so it becomes really a actually a knowledge management tool about the knowledge in the didactics that you have in your um, institution and also here you can put them the same cards in the same way. And so we're, we are really fascinated by this method. Um, maybe you can watch enough of the videos about this or also have a look at this um, if you consider to train um, teachers on how to use learning analytics in their classes. Um, another more high-tech method to train teachers um, are hackathons or um, data competitions. What you see here to the left is basically one data set that has been used by different um, teams and they provided different visualizations. So it's a nice way also to, to understand well the data that you provide, if you apply different classification algorithms to it and if you do different um, other things to it, then you can represent this data in a very different way. And it's also a way to be, really become aware of, um, of data uh, and especially if this data is meaningful to your organization. And um, this was for us also an eye opener when we did this uh, already in 2014, <clears throat> that it is really powerful to, to have these um, hackathons, to use the data set and then to work with it in certain, um, with certain questions about that. And um, you can also do this uh, more guided and you provide the digital tools that are not so afforded and that are not so difficult to use and put teams together to basically work on this. But this is a very powerful method too, um, where, where you can work on a demanding data challenge on a topic you want to work on or to train a community on um, how to work with new types of data for digital tools. And getting to the end of my, uh, of the presentation of the report and that's our well, a, a vision we formulated for a learning Alex supported professional training program. Um, and there we thought, uh, yeah, why, why should actually uh, someone or an organization put out a professional training program on learning analytics or usage of data in education? And so, and the reasons are really pretty clear. Well, many higher education institutions increasingly take advantage of learning analytics in their study programs. Um, also, when you buy in certain tools, they have an analytics component in the meantime. And the teachers, therefore, facing increasingly learning analytics systems in their classrooms. And But while initial teacher education at universities lays foundation for these first years of the teacher's career, there are far more relevant uh, professionalization happens in the years thereafter, and also technology develops thereafter. And therefore, we are actually reassured that it would really make sense to have a continuous um, professionalization program for teachers um, on, on the topic of analytics because also technology with the latest um, chat GBT, you might have um, followed this discussion, it's all over in the media, 
really changes uh, educational practices and um, also demands new uh, concepts for assessment and so on to us. And therefore, teachers need to be aware of this. And I think there, there is a space for this um, professional education of teachers. And how could you do this? Well, consider the target group. It will be more adult learners than students or pupils. That's something to take into account. And it's teaching professionals. So um, you should also consider that they really know about educational theories and you should not provide them with easy quick win analytics like the one that I showed you about counting blog posts and so on, but rather provide them also with a method of teach as you breach method to really show them um, an attractive feedback that comes from analytic methods to also be an eye opener for them. Um, when they go back to their schools, what else on analytics they can do or to challenge the, the systems they bought or apply currently. Yeah, that already brings us for <clears throat> to the end of the presentation of this first um, day um, with the announcement again for the webinar tomorrow. And I'm very pleased that we have time to discuss now um, what is much more meaningful for you guys than listening to me and because all of this is also in the report. Great, many, many thanks, uh, Professor Draxler. So uh, for that uh, interesting overview on the topic. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple of questions myself, but there have been two questions um, posted in the chat. So um, uh, let's start with those. Um, I'm also gonna give uh, everybody the opportunity to um, directly answer, uh, directly raise their questions um, so you can use your microphone. If you want to do that, please raise your hand um, and then I will give you the relevant um, rights and you can directly ask your question. I, I would like to also um, um, highlight that um, I think this is a really great opportunity to ask questions, not just about uh, what Professor Drexler was talking about in this presentation, but maybe also quite practical questions. You might be considering um, using learning analytics in your own context. Um, and as, as Professor Drexler was talking about, I mean, he has quite a lot of experience of uh, also the implementation and of course also the research. Um, so I think it's a really good opportunity to to um, yeah ask any questions you might have. and. Um, I see there are a couple already here, but uh, yeah, please, please keep them coming. Let's start with a question from, um, it's actually a colleague of mine who also works on the European School Net Academy, uh, Effie Saltido. Effie, do you want to uh, raise your question directly yourself? Do you have microphone rights? Yes, sure. Um, well, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, my question is uh, the following. It's more about the critics on the um, on the data and metrics in learning analytics in general and the fact that they can lead in a narrow uh, view on student learning and neglect maybe other important aspects such as, such as creativity, critical thinking and uh, emotional intelligence, for example. Um, I would like to hear your view on that and also uh, another point is uh, concerning the lack of uh, knowledge or understanding of the field of learning analytics by administrators and educators, and uh, which may lead to misuse or misinterpretation of the data and results. So I suppose some education and training is needed in this area as well. So I would like to hear your views, your view and uh, your suggestions uh, related to these two, actually it's two questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Effie. That's that's wonderful questions, and you really um, you really raise critical ones here that um, that I really appreciate. Um, so, uh, regarding your first question about the narrow view, um, I, I fully um, I fully second actually what you're saying here. So there is also a clear danger. It's but it's in all systems. Whenever we bring a number up. Let's just put it as a number, analytics as an output, output is a number basically, then these numbers can be misleading. Huh? So there was once, um, I don't know if it's a true story or something, that somebody came into a library in UK and there was a student that moves his uh, entry, um, he always moved through the entry out and in, and then someone asked what you're doing here and he said, oh, I need to increase my library score. So this would be a typical example of a misleading analytics indicator if we would take this into account. Um, and, and 
sometimes these numbers also get an own dynamic, right? It's really like a Pandora box. Um, also the example that I showed you, it, it, this, this spider graph was gave feedback to that group was really intended with the do with the target to support the students to um, better um, uh, to better balance their work. But then quickly um, the teacher said, oh, that's great. We want to use this for the assessment. And, and this is a repurposing of that whole thing it was invented to, but we also forbid basically, um, because this would have been an unfair treatment. It would not have, not have been mentioned in the beginning and so on. So there's a lot to say about um, about these numbers that, that are brought up. Um, and especially if you buy into such a system, very often you don't have the technical still to do something like this on your own, or you need to work with a partner like us um, then uh, in a project or so, then you can do this. But most of the time you buy into a system. And also there we need to be very honest that many of these systems, the analytics is not well developed. It's just written there. The data behind is very weak. When you talk to an engineer of one of these systems, they never thought about competences. What is a competence? They just use certain uh, numbers, put them together, and then there's a number out. So th this is why critical thinking is so much needed. And there's no, um, well, Trian which also said it once, there's no one size fits all solution to analytics. It's always an analytic process is close to um, the philosophy or the culture of your organization. Because you also need to give this number a place and you also need to know what is behind this number. Um, and this is why we say, well, there is no one size fits all and you do need to do it very carefully. But what I showed you thereafter was the new approach that we applied now. We have highly satisfied students. You need to imagine in, 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 the, in Frankfurt, you come into one of these introduction courses, you sit there with 1000 students or with 800 other students. You don't get any feedback at all. And what we can do now with this uh, highly informative learning analytics is that in one week, we give you feedback on certain dimensions that are really important and that are competences you should develop um, during your studies. And this this is where I believe in and where I think there, there is power, um, but it really it takes more time to invest this. And then we consider not creativity, but we consider critical thinking, for instance. And I'm also not a fan of emotional uh, in emotion tracking, emotional uh, intelligence. Um, so it, we really go for certain competences like uh, critical thinking is definitely one of that. Um, <clears throat> but also, uh, for instance, uh, planning, um, uh, customizing. We have one other exercise where you need to read a text and then you need to make a concept map. And we can follow you how you do this concept map and can support you and really give you feedback if you understood the concepts that, that you're modeling there, your own well, and how you can improve this. So there is this highly informative level that we really get to with more data, but you need to have a good expert to do this. And I would not trust um, the next analytics around the corner. Yeah, I don't, so this is my take on this. Um, um, and that also applies then to the administrator part, what I told actually about the com commercial companies, then you quickly, I mean, it's a company, they need to earn money. They quickly make an indicator up and they don't put much research behind this. So in that sense, there, there, there is a challenge and there's a lot of space of critical thinking about this, yes. Many thanks for that comprehensive answer. Um, there's a couple more questions uh, coming up here. Uh, one question is from Anna Maria Lizotti um, about if a teacher would like to learn about learning analytics, are there workshops or courses in Europe or online? Um, do you have anything that comes to mind from your perspective um, that's well, worth flagging up there? In Europe, well, the Society of Learning Analytics Research has really a strong um, movement always to implement it also in schools, at least it was before the pandemic. Um, and there's always also a practitioner track, but then you need to attend this conference. Uh, it will be in Texas in March again, but then it moves also um, next year will be Japan and so on. But there is an offer and they also have a lot of um, webinars that you can sign up for free where you see latest research of people, it's more the research community, but this is a very open community that you can join in and make connection to. But then there's no tailored offer for, for teachers actually in Europe. So I think this is really um, a gap 
that 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 also Benjamin and European Schoolnet identified, I guess. Yeah, and I, I must also say that at the level of uh, our offer, European School Net Academy, we don't have something dedicated to learning analytics in particular. We do have a course coming up on the topic of artificial intelligence, AI basics for schools. Um, so there are elements linked to the use of data being picked up there. And then also um, on the European School Education platform from the European Commission um, uh, back in last year, November, there was a course on the effective use of data in, in, in the classroom. So um, there are courses out there and we'll can put the put the links in the in the chats in a, in a moment. Um, but there's definitely not enough. So um, that's uh, definitely something that we we had um, identified and, and one of the reasons why we also wanted to address this topic here today. Um, there's another question here from Federico Malpica. Uh, Federico, do you want to um, maybe raise your question directly to Professor Draxler? Um, and I can give you the uh, um, rights to do so. Just give me a second, yes. Okay, so you should now be able to unmute yourself and also show your camera. Right. Go. So please go ahead. Thank you, Benjamin, and thank you very much, Professor Drasler. Uh, I have two questions. One is related to, I, I'm a practitioner of uh, teaching training and we are using a platform to, to develop this teaching training in different Spanish speaking countries mostly. But um, my questions are, one is uh, what are the best practices uh, using learning analytics um, related to artificial intelligence uh, for teaching training that you know. This is, you have some, some examples about it. And the other, what is my mainly concern is that not, it's, it's not about the, the, the instructional design of the course, but the instructional design after the course. So my mm -hmm. second question is, how can uh, learning analytics can be applied to following up teachers after teaching training when they have to transfer to their own classrooms? Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Federico. Also very, very important question. Let me just make one one clarification because I'm I'm not sure if, if this is clear when we talk artificial intelligence. I mean, this is a sea of algorithms, right? And when we talk learning analytics, it's the application of artificial intelligence in education purposes. So in that sense, um, learning analytics is about artificial intelligence and the application of it very strongly. And um, regarding your question, what are the best practices um, of using artificial intelligence for teacher training? So really train the teachers um, to, to become knowledgeable about this, I guess is your question. Um, we have been designing a course that we um, thought that is, um, is important to know. And, and also in that course, um, we, we first do actually an exercise on ethics and privacy. Because especially for a teacher in the class, um, it's important to know where the boundaries of this information is. Um, um, and then thereafter, um, we we really what we do now is we apply this Folar method very strongly. That that is also um, uh, easy to be accessible. You can attend courses for this and so on. Um, and then we 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 used this um, board game. It's actually a method to really lay out with the teachers. And the nice thing about Fola is we can really can carry one everyone from where they are. So you come to a class, uh, you come to a session with the Fola board, and you just tell us what what you teach and how you do it. And you put the cards. We have cards for this. You put it on the on that um, board game. Um, and then we, we we ask you what are what is actually information you're missing? I mean, what is the target of the learning analytics in your teacher training? What do you want to achieve with this? Um, uh, and then when based on this information that this person wants to know that goes to there's no one size fits all. It needs to be dedicated. We can tell you what are certain indicators and informations, for instance, from this um, open learning analytics repository, you could use to measure certain things and to provide feedback. And only if you satisfy this individual question someone has, I think then it's successful. And you can start very small. You can start really very small, but you, you should start small. And once the people see the potential of it, like I showed you in this very early example I had 13 years ago, I think then then, then you basically have an, uh, a momentum that 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 grows. And regarding your second question, how can learnings be applied uh, to following up? Then, 
Um, what we do then there, we do a lot of um, dashboard work. In the beginning, we send out email with text, but the problem with this email is we cannot follow up what they actually do with it. So we do dashboards in the meantime. We also see how often they consult these dashboards and we try to make them very actionable. And we also ask them in these um, dashboards, not just showing this information, but they, they rate for us how well this information is, if they can uh, understand this information and they write a reflection prompt um, for their own, what they want to do with this information. And But this is a, currently a research we do and with one of our um, uh, partners, we also um, do this in Germany currently. They, they are um, teachers that get a, um, information from analytics activity and they send out feedback messages to, um, to students then in that class. Um, that's also something we do. So we work a lot about over dashboards, but making them active, not just presenting information, having their act interaction with the dashboard. I hope that answers your question a bit. Great, many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Frederick, also for the question. Um, <clears throat> now, there haven't been any further questions in the chat, so I'll take the opportunity um, to, to still ask uh, my own question. Uh, and I'm wondering if in the research literature there is any discussion about the impact that, for example, these dashboards that you have mentioned can have on the instructor or the teacher trainer or the teacher. Um, so does it, for example, um, change their perception of their own role? Um, is there a danger that the professional judgment or agency of the instructor is eroded through this process of providing them all this information um, and potentially giving them predictions or even quite strong suggestions about certain actions regarding their learners? You are great. You are great people here. So, so mandatory important questions that you put on me. That's really fantastic to see. Um, and Benjamin, yeah, um, actually, the problem with research is um, we can nicely do research on dashboards with students because there are always many students, but there are not so many teachers. So you end up in a paper that has um, as data points one to ten uh, teachers. And there's not so much work actually really on what teachers do with this. We see this increasing now slowly with qualitative research, interview studies they did and so on. Um, but also there, there's, it's really unexplored, um, um, an unexplored area and a lot more work to do with this. Um, what we see with what, what a personal, well, it's not based on, on evidence now, but a personal thing that really surprised me in that work where we have been working with that STEM education, physics teachers and so on, um, and provided them that uh, a dashboard where information is, and then they can send out feedback messages. And we, we did not dare to write the feedback messages. So we gave them templates, but actually they came then back to us and said, oh, that's great. Could you make the full text for us that we just send it out? And I was kind of shocked of this because then, I mean, Artificial intelligence uh, also with JetGBT or learning analytics makes us um, lazy in a way, right? We don't use our brain anymore. And I was kind of shocked seeing this reaction because I thought it's really in the responsibility of the teacher to not send out automatic feedback messages rather than really think about it and customize them and make them, give them the personal touch they need. And um, so, yeah, there's a this is an area that really needs to be explored, Benjamin, and there is a lot of to gain and learn from. Um, and I cannot give you the full answer to this right now. So, okay, many thanks. Um, well, still lots of work uh, to do for sure in this area, but uh, super interesting to to listen to your thoughts. Um, and and insights there um we are now approaching the end so i do just quickly want to say a few more words um about our session tomorrow um so i'm just gonna go back to my slides apology i need to stop sharing i guess uh, it's okay i think it does it automatically so um uh, yeah, first of all, um, just to quickly mention it, I've I've put the link already in the chat, but um, you can see again here the link to the report drafted by Professor Draxler. Um, it's, uh, I think, really useful reading, uh, especially as a follow up. And if you're interested in this topic, you can find it on our website. Um, and then 
please also join us tomorrow for a continuation of this discussion that we've started today. Um, we will be joined by, um, well, three external practitioners and uh, myself. I will also be talking about um, our own experiences um, with the use of data at the European School Net Academy, but then we also have um, our colleague Madeleine Murray, for, who's National Coordinator at the Professional Development Service for Teachers in Ireland, who will be speaking about their use of data. We have uh, Honor Cara de Mia, who's a researcher and founder of StudyCore, which provides uh, edu edtech tools to schools and universities with a focus on adaptive learning and learning analytics dashboard. And as part of that, they do teacher training as well. So they're going to be, he's going to be talking about that experience. And then we also have uh, Rui Pacheco, who's director of the multimedia division of uh, uh, educational publisher uh, from Portugal who provide a virtual learning environment used by 80% of teachers in Portugal and who also do a lot of training as part of that um, and of course make use of the data that they get from the platform as part of that data. So um, yeah, um, please do join us tomorrow, uh, same time, 2 uh, p.m., 2 in the afternoon, Central European time. Uh, you should have received the link already, but uh, I will send out a, a follow-up to this first webinar later tonight, also with a reminder of the link for the session tomorrow. Many thanks for joining us today and many thanks again to Professor Draxler for the interesting keynote presentation and for drafting the report. And uh, yeah, I wish everyone a good rest of the afternoon and hopefully see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone.